I'll start by saying thank you to the Friends of Cecil Sharp House for hosting this event. The Friends of Cecil Sharp House is an organization devoted to traditional dance. Uh, full disclosure, I'm on the organizing committee. You can find out more about all of our events on our website. Uh, and I believe um, Bernie's gonna put a link to that in the chat. Uh, but if not, it is fcsh.org.uk. Thank you to all of you for signing up for this workshop. We had an outstanding response from people uh, around the globe, which was um, a little bit surprising. Uh, but also very gratifying. My name is Louise Siddons uh, and I'm a caller based primarily in Stillwater, Oklahoma, although I also spend a lot of time in the UK. I call English and Contra. I've been calling for about 13 years and I run our monthly caller workshop series here in Oklahoma. I started calling positionally in 2017. Before that, I'd been using a variety of alternative role terms as well as traditional gendered terms, depending on where I'd been hired. And today I still defer to organizer preference, although I find that many dancers and organizers don't notice the lack of role terms when I call positionally. This workshop is free um, in lieu of a fee. And if you're able, we're suggesting a donation to the Albert Kennedy Trust, a charity that supports LGBTQ plus people aged 16 to 25 in the UK who are facing or experiencing homelessness or living in a hostile environment. Their work is even more urgent as we head into the winter months. Um, I hope you're all also supporting your local dance organizations. Many people have been doing really good work keeping us all connected during the pandemic. So what is positional calling? Positional calling is a style of teaching social folk dance that emphasizes patterns, flow, and relationships between dancers. It's appropriate for a wide variety of contexts as the calls make no assumptions about the individual dancers present and therefore it adapts well to any group. Historically, positional calling has appealed primarily to teachers who are working in ungendered environments and more recently because of that, it's gained wider traction with dancers interested in gender-free experiences. Various strategies for gender-free dancing have existed for over 30 years and range from positional calling to alternative role names. In my experience, positional calling has the most positive results for dancers. They don't need to remember a new role term and positional walkthroughs emphasize transitions and flow or punctuation in a way that traditional role-based walkthroughs often don't. So positional calling actually makes the dance easier to remember for the dancers. Positional calling invites dancers to think holistically about the patterns they're dancing, but it's also very relational. Um, I spend a lot of time identifying where dancers are in relation to their partner, their neighbor, their shadow, et cetera. So what's possible in a Zoom workshop for callers that's about calling um, positionally? We can't practice much and that's a pretty significant limit. Uh, so what I'm gonna do today is offer you my strategies for positional calling and I'm gonna to try to answer your questions and I hope we're gonna have some interesting conversations about a couple of dances that we'll use uh, as examples. I'm an experienced positional caller, but I'm not the authority or the last word on this topic. Calling like every other part of social folk dancing is collaborative and situation specific. What works in one room for one set of dancers won't work in another. The best calling is not formulaic, even though the best callers work hard uh, to find formulas that work for them. I'm gonna run quickly through the next few slides because they're repeats from the ECD workshop I did a month ago. That video is available online if you wanna hear the details. The ground rules are that change is hard and also change is inevitable. There's no one right answer. A poor workman blames his tools, but you should buy the best tools you can afford. That's a metaphor for how you decide to call. And lastly, listen, learn, and reflect. You don't have to use everything that I offer you um, or that other people in the workshop offer, but do think about what they mean and why you're responding the way you are and what you might take from it, even if it's not what was offered. And then some starting premises, whether or not we as individuals want to, we as callers are losing a piece of information that we used to have. Uh, that piece of information is gender roles. Dancers are no longer dancing in heteronormative couples. So our job as callers is to adapt to that change in information and help dancers succeed in a new uh, environment, new to us, if not to them. Premise number two is that everything new feels unnatural at first, and then we get used to it. Every time you try something new, you're a beginner and there's a learning curve. Be patient with yourself about that. And lastly, the teaching is more important than the calling. This is something that I think as callers, we've all experienced. If you have a great walkthrough, then you don't really have to work at the calling bit because you've taught people to dance well. So this workshop is an introduction to positional calling. My working assumption is that it's new to you, although I know we do have a lot of experienced dancers and callers here, but I'm gonna underscore that second point. There's a learning curve. And in the pre-workshop survey, 
I asked if there are dances you're particularly curious about and uh, full credit to all of you who answered that survey. You went to the heart of where the challenges are for positional calling, but some of you also suggested some dances that are flat out tricky to call. They're not tricky for positional callers, they're tricky period. So we're not gonna talk about those today and it's not because we couldn't work out how to call them positionally, it's just because we would take the whole hour and a half to do it and also because I do believe that we need to learn to walk before we try to fly. So we're gonna give ourselves permission to be new. So our agenda today, part one, I'm gonna talk about my introductory lesson, which I offer as an example, not as a prescription, but to think about um, how the uh, logic of positional calling starts from the moment you uh, step onto the dance floor. And so the introductory workshop or lesson is a really important part of what I do as a caller. Part two is using flow and anchors. These are the two things that I think about the most when I'm working out how to call a dance. So we're gonna ask ourselves, how do we look at contra dance choreography from a positional perspective, looking for those things. Part three, we're gonna talk about challenges. This will be the harder dance that we're gonna look at. And then part four will be Q and A. I've taken a few questions from the pre-workshop survey that I'll answer off the bat, but we'll also open it up to questions from all of you. All right, so jumping into part one. Some dances give half an hour to an introductory lesson or workshop. Other dances don't even have one. I think they're a really good idea if your goal in any way is to attract uh, and retain new dancers. And for me as a traveling caller, at least, it's a wonderful opportunity to acclimate people to my style, um, to build trust with the dancers uh, before we jump into the dance itself, and also to discover local preferences, um, things like promenade positions, star handholds, things that change depending on where you are in the world. For positional callers, an introductory workshop is also the perfect opportunity to reinforce positional ways of thinking to both new dancers and experienced ones. I outline my complete introductory contra workshop on my website, but I think it's important to talk about, so we're going to look at some of that workshop today. I'm going to boil it down to the most relevant bit for positional calling, which is teaching the swing. That's the most relevant bit because a swing is a figure that has built-in orientation. A couple of things to keep in mind as I do that, successful positional calling starts with good introductory teaching. This is a little bit like what I was saying before about the walkthrough being more important than the call. If you give people a good grounding in what they're about to do, then not only does it give them some skills, but it also, like I said earlier, builds trust. It's really important to, uh, to think about yourself as a teacher and that goes for any kind of calling, positional or no. In any dance uh, with a swing, Roles are necessary, even if the terms aren't. So positional calling, the goal is to get rid of role terms, but there are roles, like there's a right side and left side to a swing. And so we have to pay attention to that, respect that, figure out how to talk about that. So the first step in positional contra calling for me is figuring out how you're gonna teach that fixed orientation figure. And finally, demonstrations are key to good teaching. Uh, remember to use all the tools you have. And I put that on this list because we are in a Zoom environment and I can't uh, line you all up and I can't give you the workshop. Like if we were doing this in person, I would just literally teach you guys the workshop that I teach so that you could see how it works. My introductory lesson is built around the ideas of connection and orientation. So I start by saying contra dancing uses connection and orientation to help all of us dance together. And then I go through a variety of things. So we're gonna skip to the middle and talk about how figures move you. I use an element to talk about this. I have everyone face the person next to them. That's now their partner. I'm gonna do the rest of this as though I'm talking to dancers. You could stand up and pretend you're doing it if you like. So you're next to your partner, uh, face that partner. Alamand right once around, I would be demonstrating this. So you put your right hand up. I teach it as kind of a high five hold so that we're not curling our thumbs or fingers around each other. Okay, so we are uh, facing our partner. We alamand, high five hold, alamand right, eight counts. We count it out together. Now go once and a half in the same eight counts. And um, I talk about connection and how you can increase or decrease your pressure to speed up or slow down with your partner. So in most of the figures that we do, the caller, that's me, will tell you how far to go and where to end. If you alamand once around, you end where you started. If you alamand once and a half, you've traded places with your partner. But a swing, unlike an alamand or a do -si do or most of the other figures that we do, has a built-in orientation. When you do a swing, you end in a prescribed place, not in the place that I tell you. So we're gonna learn how to swing and then we explore how the built-in orientation works. Whenever you swing someone, I'll tell you who or where you as a couple should face at the end. 
but the swing itself determines exactly where you end up in relation to the person you're swinging. Knowing who or which direction you should be facing will help you orient yourself during the dance. So as you face into the circle, take hands with just your partner. At this point, people are holding hands with their partner. This is how you're gonna end the swing. For me, this is an aside, in a positional uh, introductory workshop, um, one of the first and most important things I teach people is that they should always stay connected because contra dancing is about connection. So you're gonna end a swing connected to the person you swung with a handhold. Notice uh, that then you have a free hand. Your free hand is gonna be your pointy hand. Um, so we're gonna join those hands with our partner's uh, free hand and we're gonna point into the middle of the circle. So now, I don't I hope you can see me. Uh, I, in theory, have a hand with my partner and we have our pointy hands out in front of us and they're connected. Notice that your pointing hands are pointing in the direction that you're facing. So we're facing into the middle of the circle theoretically and our pointy hands are pointing to the middle of the circle. Also, the person whose right hand is pointing is on the right of their partner. My partner is imaginary, but here. Um, and the person whose left hand is pointing is on the left. So that will be important. You'll keep that ending position either on the right or the left corresponding to your pointy hand, no matter who you're swinging uh, throughout the dance. Some people have a strong preference for one side or the other. Uh, and this might be because it's what they're used to. It might be the result of an injury. There could be some other reason why they have a preference, but you should always ask, do you have a preference for which side you dance on? Or you can offer, uh, I'd like to dance with you. I prefer the left-hand side. It's okay to have a preference, um, but you should always discuss your preferences with your partner. Do that now. So in the workshop, people say, do you prefer the right or the left? They do, they have that conversation. Some of them switch, some of them don't. Um, and then uh, we actually learn how to swing. So once you've agreed with your partner about sides, reconnect your pointy hands. Now close into ballroom position. And that again, I demonstrate. Stand slightly offset with your right feet next to each other. Um, at this point is demo. I'm gonna assume everyone here knows how to swing. So I'm not gonna belabor that, blah, blah, blah. You swing, you end with your uh, pointy hands pointing the direction you wanna face. You let those hands go and you stay connected with your other hand. Um, staying connected at the end of the swing will improve the flow of the dance and it'll make things easier and more fun. And then the final thing that I say about swinging is that some people will switch throughout the dance. Um, and it's important to trust other dancers to know where they're supposed to be. You're responsible for knowing your role. You're not responsible for fixing other people. In the pre-workshop survey, several people asked about formation um, and how to get people lined up. Most modern contra dances are improper or some variation thereof like Beckett um, or indecent. Uh, I've stopped naming improper in uh, my introductory workshop and usually when I'm calling as well, I won't say this is improper. I'll just say line up for a contra dance. People line up improper. I fix them if I need to from there. Um, so here's how I get into a, uh, an improper formation. I ask people to line up in a long ways set. And at this point, um, I should say that I encourage the experienced dancers in the room to join into the introductory workshop. I don't uh, like it when it's only new dancers there. Um, and that's partly because experienced dancers can be helpful, but also because usually I'm uh, one of the only positional callers people have been exposed to. And so it's an opportunity for me to introduce the experienced dancers to that kind of vocabulary and logic and get them on my side to a certain extent. So I have experienced dancers there uh, and I ask them to help get everyone into a long ways set, which I just define as like couples lining up in a long line. So we all line up and then I say, take hands for, identify your neighbors. In my uh, workshop, this is the first time that they've really understood the concept of a neighbor. Um, so we talk about the hands for and neighbors and then, uh, your partner is across from you, swing your partner and end facing your neighbors. So this is a way to practice the swing and also practice facing in a certain way after the swing. So you swing, you face your neighbors, you let go of your pointy hands, you stay connected to your partner and now you are improper. So that's really straightforward. And then I say, this is the standard starting position for contra dances. Um, the caller will tell you if you need to be somewhere different but otherwise when you join a dance, you should join um, in this formation. And I point out that you don't literally have to swing. 
you can just get with your partner, point your pointy hands and open up and you're done. You're in the right place. We then go through progression and I note that when they're out of the end, they can swing and end facing the set and then they'll again automatically be in the correct place. Um, obviously, if the dance is not improper, then you have to say something different to them, but that's true no matter who you're calling to or how you're calling. So a couple of things to note, my intro workshop is very repetitious uh, and that's because that's how people learn. Um, you know, I'm a teacher, I've been teaching for 20 something years um, and repetition is the way that it happens. So I don't feel bad about being repetitive. Uh, the more you repeat things in the intro workshop when people are in the space of learning, the less you have to repeat when you're actually calling the dance when people are a little less interested in hearing you talk a lot. Um, you don't have to do what I do. This is, like I said, just a thing that I'm uh, offering as a, uh, an example of how I've worked this out over time. Um, remember rule two, there is no one right answer to any of this. All right, so uh, this is a dance that someone suggested in the pre-workshop um, survey. It is Hay in the Barn by Chart Guthrie. I've given you a brief, brief gloss of the choreography there. And as we watch the video, I want us to think about where are the moments of flow and where are the anchor points? It's a very short video. It's just about one and a half, maybe two times through the dance. Pay attention to the moments of flow and anchor points. And um, as you do that, you will also notice that not all of the dancers are doing the dance correctly, which I think is an important part of what we think about when we think about calling is what do we do when the inevitable happens and people uh, get lost? So here we go. I'm gonna leave the slide up so that we have the choreography as a reference. So are there moments of flow that people notice? The hay. The hay, yeah. Yeah, so does the hay, the hay is a flowy figure, but does it uh, have a flow, uh, does it flow into it? Is there a good transition? Well, it flows beautifully from the chain into a hay. Mm -hmm. yeah, you're already going around one person and you just go straight back in and follow basically the same uh, footpath. Yeah, for the people who are crossing in the chain, it's exactly the same path, the chain and then the hay. So there's great flow from the chain into the hay. Yeah. Are there other moments of flow? I, I find the swing to a chain is can be difficult sometimes because the momentum you kind of there's a change for the right hand side person mm -hmm. yeah and that's a really good point for me that's one of the benefits of this uh sort of mantra that i have of stay connected you swing you stay connected and then you can actually uh use your it's like a change of momentum but you can mm -hmm. use your handhold to go into that chain right or the person who's not crossing the set can use the handhold to bounce uh, the person they've just courtesy turned into the hay. Um, and so, um, or into the chain rather in this dance. Um, so that connection, like a lot of, when I started contra dancing, people stayed connected just routinely. And I've noticed in the past decade or so that a lot of people just drop you um, when you're done swinging. And uh, for me, it's been kind of a, a, a teaching um, point regardless of the terms I'm using or the way that I'm calling to say, you know, if you stay connected, you can actually improve your, the feel of the dance. You can make it more fun. What about anchor points? Are there anchor points in this dance? What do I mean by an anchor point? Good question. Um, so for me, an anchor point is a place where I, as a caller can say, you are in this place and the dancer can check themselves and say, ah, yes, I am in that place. In contra dancing, it's almost never a fixed place, like if you are an English dancer, 
and I say um, top first corner, that's a fixed place in a hands four. Um, you could walk to that place um, regardless of where you are without having any other people around. But there's not that equivalent thing in contra dance. So in contra dance, for me, an anchor point is uh, am I with my partner? Am I across the set from my partner? Am I next to my neighbor? Am I across from my neighbor? So where are the anchor points in this dance according to that definition? End of each swing. Yeah, at the end of each swing, but also at the beginning, right? Like we can say, do half a hay uh, and end on the side of the set with your partner. Um, or the chain, you can offer an anchor point. You're chaining across the set to your partner or to your neighbor. When you say with your partner balance or when your neighbor balance, that's the lock points right there because that mm -hmm. tells the person exactly where they're supposed to be, not physically, but who they're supposed to be with. Yeah. And yeah. stop so the it's, flow. Exactly. So contra dancing is full of kind of these relational anger points. Who are you with? Um, and to a certain extent, where are you? You know, like we would say, for example, potentially the ones are above the twos. So part of thinking about anchor points is also thinking ahead about your walkthrough, right? We haven't talked about the walkthrough for this dance yet, but if we were doing a dance where it was important to know if you were a one or a two, you wanna make sure that you've introduced that concept. In this dance, uh, people really only need to know kind of who's your partner, who's your neighbor, what does on the side mean as opposed to anything else. But um, those are all things that are, uh, hopefully coming up in your program sooner than you would call this dance. So if we think about flow and anchors, um, I've marked flow in green and anchor points in red, not all of them. Um, we just listed a lot more than I bothered to highlight. But I wanted to think about how I would teach that walkthrough. So on my cards, I generally um, have the words that I'll actually say when I'm calling in black, and then I use blue for teaching notes, things that I'll say in the walkthrough or that I might say if people are struggling um, during the dance. And then, as I said, I've also used red and green here, um, which I wouldn't ordinarily put on my card. So this is a dance that might well appear relatively early on in a program because it doesn't have a lot of, it doesn't have a high piece count. It has some repetition. Um, it doesn't have a lot of unusual figures in it. So I'm fairly pedantic in my teaching notes. Um, that's partly so that you can see my thought process. My actual card for this doesn't have this much blue on it. In a real calling situation, I probably wouldn't say everything written here because I would have built some of these introduction in concepts into uh, the program. So for example, I say uh, demo the chain if necessary and demo the hay if necessary. I would never put this on a program in a situation where it required me to demonstrate both the chain and a half hay for the first time. Um, but mm -hmm. maybe it would be the first time I did a half a hay, in which case I would do a demo. Louise? Yeah. Um I see in your notes, you say right hand chain. Mm -hmm. Now, in my mind, that's a little confusing because most chains that I know of are with the right hand, but are you meaning the right side person chain or the left side person chain? And so here is, why don't I just do the walkthrough, which will answer the question. But I will say also, I call a fair number of dances with left hand chains in them. So um, that is maybe a regional um, difference or uh, a difference between my calling box and yours, um, but a right hand chain is not your only choice. So take hands four, face your neighbor. I should also say if you want to, I mean, I, I said at the beginning, we can't really dance, but if you wanna think about this by standing up and following my walkthrough and seeing if it works for you, it's really hard when you are imagining the other three people in your minor set, but it could be worthwhile uh, to try. So take hands four, face your neighbor with that neighbor balance and swing. Stay connected. Notice your next neighbor. Um, they're gonna be important later. And that swing facing across. So you've swung your neighbor, you're facing across. Two of you have a right hand free. You have a right hand free because you are still connected to your neighbor. We're gonna do a chain. And as I say in my notes, there might be a demonstration necessary. I would not call this dance if I hadn't already called a chain because I think the half hay is the harder figure. Um, so I'm gonna pretend you all know how to chain. Across the set, it's a right hand chain. The people with the right hand free extend their hands to each other. They pull by right, courtesy turn on the far side. Take that forward momentum from the courtesy turn straight into a half hay, passing right to start. So the same two people that cross the set in the chain start half a hay. Again, if you have to demo, demo. 
if you are demoing, it's worth pointing out that for the people who crossed in the chain, it's the same track that they're walking, the same pattern as Eric pointed out before. Meet your partner, balance and swing. Stay connected at the end of that swing, across the set, right hand chain. It's the same two who chained before. This time you're chaining to your neighbor, but use that courtesy turn to send you right back in for a half hay. Out of that half hay, look for your next neighbor. Remember them? You met them at the beginning of the dance. Um, and then go from there. So for me, the important anchor points are noticing your next neighbor because out of a half hay, a lot of people don't know where to look. If you watched the video closely, you may have noticed that a ton of people were like, here, I'm here, you are looking for me uh, in the new neighbor swing. Um, and that's because half a hay can be pretty disorienting for people. So I like saying like, this is the person you're aiming for. Don't forget them, at least the first time. Um, that you're doing the walkthrough. Finding your partner at the end of the half hay, it's an anchor point. I don't know how important it is, but the person that new dancers are most likely to be able to find is their partner. So I highlight it. Um, also with the second chain, it's the same people crossing. Um, for a lot of dancers, uh, especially if they are mostly local dancers who don't travel a lot, who don't go to dance weekends or festivals, a right hand chain might be the only chain they've ever encountered. But as I said uh, a few minutes ago, I have uh, a bunch of dances, not all of them complicated, uh, very few of them complicated that have left hand chains in them. So sometimes the first chain is uh, one half of the couple crossing and the second chain is the other um, partner crossing. So it's useful for them to know it's the same person. And then those flow moments. Um, really thinking about flow in terms of transitions, because our goal as positional callers is to give dancers a storyline, to get them to remember the dance because of the pattern that it creates as a whole, rather than as a set of individual figures. And this is what I meant earlier on when I said that I think that positional calling actually uh, encourages us to teach better and to make the dancers better. Because if you think about um, particularly kind of, uh, very basic calling with gendered terms, we do tend to say, now you do this figure. Now these people do this figure. And we leave it to the dancers to work out the flow, the transition between the figures. But in positional calling, it's, to, it's such an advantage to say, you've just done a chain, you're doing a courtesy turn. And as you come around, if you're moving forward already, you have momentum to continue forward. That's really, really helpful information. Um, if, uh, if you come out of a swing and then you circle left, there's momentum there. You wanna stay connected to your partner after the swing because then going into the circle allows you to just keep that momentum um, going. You're just broadening. You're kind of opening up your swing to be a larger clockwise movement. Um, so those kinds of transitions, really working those through and thinking about them and getting them to help you teach uh, are at the heart of positional calling. Um, Louise. Yeah. Could you talk, just do your explanation as you would give it to real dancers on the swing your neighbor to the chain and actually if you were talking them through the chain, this is so helpful to me. <laughs> I'm loving it. Um, well, like I said, I, I would not use this dance to teach a chain but if I was just thinking about yeah I understand that in general yeah so okay so you I'm, swung, what I'm wanting is I'm wanting to know how you would explain the chain part right um and how I teach a chain I start with uh the courtesy turn I'm trying to think it's it I should say I have not called a dance since like early March and it's really blowing my mind. I've been calling so many Zoom dances that I'm like, I teach so differently on Zoom, but I will do my best, bear with. Um, all right, so I start with the courtesy turn. So you've just swung your neighbor say, and I do the thing, if you have a right hand free, you're gonna cross the set in a second. Um, but for the moment, we're gonna practice a courtesy turn. If you are the person who's about to cross the set, you're gonna be moving forward the whole time. Um, and when you get to the other side, you're gonna do a courtesy turn. So uh, at the moment you're next to your neighbor, it's gonna be your neighbor's job um, to courtesy turn you on this side before we go. So 
put your right hand that you will have pulled by with behind your back. And I do the like, I'm a little teapot thing. Put your left hand out, connect to the left hand of your neighbor who's next to you, who you just swung. They're gonna put their right hand on your right hand on your back. And now you're both facing across, you're facing the same direction, you're side by side, you're going to turn completely uh, around as a couple with, uh, I'm talking still to the person on the right, with you walking forward. So they start walking forward and that forces their neighbor to back up, right? Because they're working as a couple and they're staying facing the same direction. So that's a courtesy turn. You went all the way around, um, but now we're gonna add the chain across in. So take your right hand, um, connect it with the person across the set from you's right hand, pull by right, and then offer your left hand to, it's your partner over there, um, and put your right hand on your back like you just had it in the courtesy turn. Keep moving forward. They scoop you up and I probably just went off the screen. Um, and then you continue forward until you're facing back in. And the other thing that's important to say in a chain is that the people who are chaining across are trading places with one another. That's the effect. So again, thinking about telling people where they end. Um, so that was a little lumpy, but hopefully that gives you a sense of, um, I think it's very hard uh, for people to do the bend in a chain. Um, so pull by right and then offer your left hand to the person on their side is an unnatural feeling thing to do for most new dancers. So teaching the courtesy turn first and then adding the chain and just having the courtesy turn be sort of three quarters of the way around instead of all the way around um, is in my experience way more successful at getting people to do that chain correctly. Um, yeah. That's exactly what I was hoping for. It's not that different, um, but I was just wanting to hear your terminology and how you explain it without using gender. That was great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Louise, if I may, it's Brian in the UK. Um, when you started off oh, teaching the swing, people were connected with an inside hand and the other hand became the pointy hand to use your expression. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that when you're just starting facing your neighbor as a distance? Who puts their pointy hand out right or left? So, yeah, this is why it's important to emphasize that the first thing that happens when you line up. So I say, make a long way set, uh, take hands for, have you and your partner had the conversation about what role you want to dance or what side you want to be on? Um, and establishing either in the instructor workshop or if you don't have the intro workshop, um, the first time you line up, say, uh, swing your partner, like just make them do it. Um, swing your partner. And then um, you can say at that point, you know, uh, do you have a preference for which side you're on? Talk about that with your partner and then end that swing facing your neighbors. Then you have them lined up and uh, if you have a bunch of new dancers saying, okay, your pointy hand is always going to be the same hand throughout this dance. It's never going to change regardless of who you swing, which I say in my intro workshop, but obviously it helps to repeat. Repetition is how we learn. Um, so then when you're facing your neighbor, you stick your pointy hand out and it doesn't matter which way it's pointing at that point. It's always going to be that same hand, but you end it pointing in the direction you want to face. It sounds like a lot of words, but um, I mean, in some ways, I guess what I want to ask you is how do you teach new dancers that they're always on that side of like, how do you teach them how to get into ballroom position, right? If you think about the fact that you have to say sort of one person puts their right hand out and one person puts their left hand out and then you go on the shoulder or on the back, like there's a lot of teaching that happens. But once you've taught it once, you can just say, which hand is your pointy hand? Stick that pointy hand out. Um, it's a, it's a trust the caller moment that you're never going to be told to swing with someone who has the same pointy hand as you. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So it feels like you're asking people to kind of internalize their role for the dance. Um, and like, which the key bit of it, the key part of it being which pointy, which hand is my pointy hand and then everything else goes from there. But like my role is my pointy hand. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's some debate about whether you should encourage people to switch inside the dance. Like a lot, of, 
I, so I, I work with a student group and I work with uh, local groups in Oklahoma uh, the most, right? Um, and both of those groups have a bunch of young dancers who are ambitious and they see other people switching while they dance and they wanna do that too. And people are like, oh, you should pick a role and stick with it until you learn that role. And I'm not sure I believe that. I think that if you understand that your pointy hand is an orientation hand, that it's gonna change where you end. Like if you switch and you're not thinking about whether you're a gent or a lady or a lark or a robin, and you're just thinking like, oh, I, now my left hand is out, I'm gonna end on the left and you stay connected, then when it's a right hand chain, you don't have a right hand chain available, right? So it's actually less confusing because you can still follow the calls. But I mean, some people are just gonna get lost anyway, which is why those anchor points matter because it's just kind of like, find your partner, balance and swing, and then you can sort it out with them. How did you get people connected in that? You were talking about swinging and I, I think I missed the very, one of the very first steps of they have a connection side when you first line up and they're the first time they're going to swing somebody and there's a connection side and, a, and then the pointy side came later. Mm -hmm. What was that first step to get them connected? So the, in, in the intro workshop, I start with everyone in a circle. And I just, I mean, we do a bunch of things, but we, so we do an alamand as the first thing that we do like with just one other person. And so I say, face the person next to you and we all pair up sort of arbitrarily. And we do an alamand and then I say face back into the circle and take hands with the person you just alamanded facing in. That's your connection. This person is now your partner. Your free hand is gonna be your pointy hand. And so regardless of people's preference at that point in the intro workshop, we learn the pointy hand concept. And then after we've learned the pointy hand concept, I say now discuss with your partner if you prefer one side or the other. And that's a moment for experienced dancers who don't mind the positional calling, but do mind having to dance a role they're not used to. That's an opportunity for them to say, you know, I really do prefer dancing on the left or on the right. Um, and they can trade places with the person they're dancing with. And it sort of normalizes that without gendering it necessarily, which is also why I say, you know, there's a bunch of reasons why people prefer a side. Me personally, I like switching sides because uh, it does reduce the chance of injury um, for me. Louise, can yeah, I thank ask you? This, this is David Smuckler from Syracuse, New York. Hi, um, hi. Uh, so <clears throat> I understand the, the idea of being encouraging a kind of flexibility uh, to end on either side. And that's great when you're with your partner. If you're swinging a neighbor, you can't choose that moment to switch sides or you'll be switching partners, right? So that's true. So, um, you know, I, I think. It, I just I just want to think about telling, especially newcomers, maybe that um, you know it's not that you want to learn one side versus another, but yeah. but to be cautious about switching um, for that reason. And with yeah, if I'm teaching new dancers, my official line is you should pick a role and stick with it for the duration of a dance. Um, because I do think it's a little bonkers to actively encourage people to confuse themselves. Um, but if they have a partner who's like, no, trust me, we could switch right now. And it's an experienced dancer. I don't necessarily want to dissuade them from doing that. If the new dancer is into it, because it's not my job to tell people what's going to be fun for them. Um, and I think that a lot of people really don't like being told they shouldn't do a thing, even if they're doing it really badly. Um, so that is one of those judgment calls, you know, it's like twirls, like there are flourishes. I've never taught. That's not true. I have done workshops on flourishes. But doing a regular walkthrough, I don't think I've ever taught a flourish in a walkthrough. Um, and people flourish, but they learn from each other. Um, and some people start trying to twirl people uh, before they understand timing or mechanics. And you just kind of have to let that happen, right? Like folk dance is chaos. Um, you kind of have to let people experiment. But no, as, as the caller is kind of the responsible adult in the room, I would never suggest that new dancers think about switching um, within a dance. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so a couple of things uh, that I wanted to point out about this walkthrough and this dance. Emphasizing the flow helps dancers remember the dance. Um, thinking about if you just say chain and then half a hey, they're not gonna remember it as soon as if you say 
And out of that chain, use your forward momentum to start a hey. Those people are gonna remember that more because you have prompted them to think about what it feels like. Um, so you're invoking different learning styles basically, which is super helpful. After you've identified the chaining people once, you don't need to do it again. Um, in this stance, the same people cross the set in the chain every time. So I pointed out in the walkthrough and then like, frankly, you can just say chain, right? Like I don't need to say across, it's that right hand chain. Um, the third time through calling this, I would just be saying chain and people know what to do. Um, and then finally those anchor points, uh, your partner um, or your next neighbor, uh, those are rescue moments. They're moments when people who've been just like flailing through the whole dance, as you saw in the video maybe, um, people who are just kind of wandering then um, the caller, uh, which I think is Steve Zagon Anderson says, um, partner, and they're like, oh, partner. And they find their partner and they're swinging and all is well. Um, so the anchor points are really important, um, just practically speaking for, for any calling. Part three is meeting challenges. Um, this is a dance that also got suggested in the uh, pre-workshop survey. It's a dance that Joseph Pimentel wrote for his partner, Fred. Um, which he intended to be uh, an overtly flirty dance. It's about partner interaction. Um, it's super partner focused and it's also heavily dependent upon eye contact to be fun. Um, for Joseph, uh, eye contact is basically part of the choreography of this dance. A couple of things make it a tricky dance for contra callers to call positionally. Um, it doesn't have a lot of physical contact. Um, dances where you're holding onto someone are always super helpful. Uh, for positional colors, because you can just say, take hands with your neighbor, take hands with your whatever, make a wave with your shadow. It's awesome. Uh, but this one doesn't have a lot of contact. It's also written by someone, uh, Joseph, who is deeply conversant in both English and Contra traditions. Um, he assigns the dance a specific tune in the Goldcrest collection. The tune is Winter Oranges by Darren Douglas. And if we were calling this as we might call an English dance, um, then it would be super simple because we could just use uh, corners. We could use first corners, second corners, and we'd be done. It's not hard at all. But as contra callers, uh, particularly in the US where those traditions are very separate, we don't have that luxury. So we're gonna watch the video. Um, I've put the calls that Diane uses in the video in here um, in an abbreviated form. Um, this is uh, in many ways language that I would never use, um, but it's what she says. So I just put it in there and we're gonna think about what uh, we might do with this dance. Mostly I want you to uh, be thinking about the question, what's the primary positional calling challenge in this dance and how might we meet it? Um, and uh, again, this is a very brief uh, excerpt of the dance. So what's the hard part to call here in terms of positional calling? Where to end the circles, I think. Potentially, you need, yeah. you need the anchor point. I wonder about how to, who's going to start the hay mm -hmm. after you gypsy, because it's a little bit of a, you're out on the floor for an indeterminate amount of times around. Who goes yeah. in first? Now that's my question. Yeah. At the very beginning. Yeah. Who even starts this? All right. So here's what I came up with. I, I did two walkthroughs. Um, so for me, this is, this, is, uh, this is a dance that I might call if I was feeling good about my local dancers on a particular night. Apart from that, it's a dance that I would call at a weekend. For me, this is a relatively challenging dance um, for a local dance group. Um, so having said that, I did a walkthrough that's extremely pedantic, and then I did a walkthrough that I would do if I had experienced dancers there. So here's the dance. I would say, face across, take hands with your neighbor. Is that your right hand? Then the dance starts with you. 
dance forward into a wave up and down the middle. You're looking at your partner who isn't in the wave. And then the call would be go forward into a wave and balance. That wave, uh, as you notice with my red, is an anchor point. Um, so if it was very new dancers, I would say notice who's in the wave with you because the person uh, who's your current neighbor will be your former neighbor and still in your hand in a second. So there's some anchoring that's possible there. It's nice to look at the people you're balancing with, but then look back at your partner who will come forward as you fall back out of the wave. Partners come in, but change your mind. Turn away from your partner and go home. Turn to the right and it's the chase. The dance is called Ramsey Chase, here's the chase. Everyone, single file circle, three places until you're on the side with your partner. I didn't make it red on the slide, but that's another anchor point, right? You're on the side with your partner and flow into a right shoulder round. Um, so again, you're moving clockwise and then you just tighten that clockwise circle. You go once and a half, but then because at that point people are doing that right shoulder round, they all wanna swing their partner, right? They think it's coming. So you stop them, you say, but then flow into a hay halfway. If you were in the wave, you're starting the hay. Pass left in the middle. Go halfway, swing your partner on the other side and facing across. And that other side, I made that blue because that's a teaching point. I wouldn't say that in the call, um, but it's a useful, again, anchoring your partner, but you're on the other side of the set than you were when you did the right shoulder round. And facing across, take hands four. Um, you stayed connected. So uh, out of that swing, you can flow really nicely into the circle left three places. You're on the side with your neighbor, swing on the side. Um, and in fact, that's uh, pretty reasonable for a walkthrough at a regular dance. That doesn't take that much time. If I were going a little faster, uh, if I was at a weekend and I'd been calling positionally the whole time, I would assume at this point that people understand that they're right hand or left hand people. So I would just say right hand folks, it starts with you forward into a wave, balance, grant your partner. Partner is come forward as they back up, but change your mind, turn around, head home. Now it's a chase, turn right, single file, three places. You're on the side with your partner, right shoulder round, once and a half into a left shoulder hay halfway. I would assume that they could figure out who was starting that hay. On the other side, swing, face across, circle, swing your neighbor. And the dance starts again by making that wave up and down the middle. Um, so I was talking fast. Uh, I would talk slower in real life so that people could keep up with me, but it's not that many words um, to teach that. So- uh, um, Question. Yeah. Uh, when the uh, gents come in, turn single, and then chase half, uh, three places round, are they in front of their partners? They are. They've come in towards uh -huh. their partner. Okay. They turn away from the partner to go home, and then they turn right and start the circle. Great. Thank you. Um, and this, again, is another great thing to demonstrate. Um, because, in fact, this is basically about a partner interaction, you don't need uh, you could demonstrate with just two people, right? You could just borrow someone and have them come forward and then turn away from you and then start chasing them. Um, but uh, yeah, on Zoom, obviously not um, not demo friendly, but that's what I would do in real life potentially. I think there's another anchor point in, in the second B. After you circle left three places, you're actually right where you began the dance. Yes. Yeah, that's also a great point. The question for me would be, is that useful information? Um, it might be useful information to say, so you're back on your home side. That could be very reassuring for people. Um, so yeah, thinking about all those connections. You could, you could use it to sort of say, and here's the progression you're swinging and now you've got your next neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, especially if earlier, um, I mean, the thing is that in this dance, the next neighbor is not as important as your next diagonal neighbor, which is not a, a phrase I would ever say when I was calling a contra dance. You know what I mean? Because you really want to be looking for the next person you're going to be in the wave with. Sure. So, but I mean, this is all good stuff, right? Like thinking about who are the important people and where are you and where are you in relation to everyone else? That's the kind of thing that when I, whenever I'm working with a new dance, I sit down, well, I don't sit down, I actually wander around my living room like a crazy person, uh, working out who's where and kind of what's happening. Um, and 
and who I care about. And this dance, um, because Joseph wrote it to be so partner focused, they're sort of like, you have a neighbor and I guess they're useful, but I can imagine doing this dance and apart from that neighbor swing at the end, never even noticing who my neighbor was particularly um, until that point at the end. Um, so yeah, thinking about all those things. As I said before, there are a lot of other ways you can do this. I have not called this dance uh, to real humans. Um, like I said, it's one that was proposed in the survey. And so as I was thinking about, okay, well, for me, the obvious challenge was how do you tell the starting people to start? And I came up with like 16 different ways and most of them were terrible. So it's definitely worth experimenting and kind of thinking through what else could you say? Uh, as I said at the beginning, I'm offering you things, but you don't have to sort of take a screenshot of this slide and be like, this is, this is the way Louise said it, it must be true. No, I'm sure if you spent um, some time with it, you would come up with a way that felt better to you. I wanted us to think about the ways in which we use our existing skills as callers, even when we're transitioning to thinking positionally. So what existing skills did we use as we worked through those two dances? We identified flow. As I said before, I think that uh, a good walkthrough will point out transitions regardless of whether you're using role terms or not. Uh, that's a pretty basic skill as a caller is thinking about how the dance works and what the transitions feel like. Devising multiple ways to explain something. Um, I didn't run through all the other ways I came up with because I don't wanna put bad ideas in your head. Um, but one of the things that you do when you encounter a new dance and you start thinking about how to call it uh, is you literally come up with different ways of calling it. You might watch videos and listen to how other people have called it. You might've paid attention when you were dancing it and decided to collect it to how it was being called at that time. But you think about how many different ways can you explain something? If I teach a chain and people still aren't getting it, I have to come up with another way to teach a chain um, because my teaching didn't work the first time. So even if you um, have to do it in the moment instead of finding the best way ahead of time, we're constantly doing that as callers. Um, Knowing the dance really well. We saw some of that in action um, just now, kind of knowing where people end, knowing um, who's important, knowing uh, how you're relating to each other, where you are on the floor or in your hands for. Um, so what other skills did we use uh, or might we use in the future as we work through dances? I know I use in my calling like Alaman, right once around and a little bit more until you face your partner or neighbor. So that until you're with a person rather than fraction. And I think mm -hmm. that would work in this. Very much so, yeah. You were talking a little bit earlier about uh, using your program, right? So like, for hay in the barn, make sure that you've taught a chain before you try to teach half a hay and a chain. Um, yeah, can you say that again, Rebecca? Um, devising the program so that you're only teaching one thing at a time, basically. Thank you. Um, I can't type and listen at the same time. I, one thing I would think about too is working with the band very carefully because depending on the level of the dance bands can choose of course various tunes and sometimes having a very clear a a b b uh structure can help the dancers through something that otherwise could be very confusing if the dance kind of gets if the music gets into this into this uh just dreamy thing that you dancers there's, there's, there's no signal from the music that makes it easy. So it makes it actually harder to be on the dance floor trying to deal with the, with the figures and the terminology. So we could help that by working with the band to select, or they select tunes that, that would better fit the types of level Absolutely. that we have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah, and I think especially when we think about uh, a, lot of, a lot of what I think about when I'm putting a program together is the balance of uh, punctuation and flow in the program, sort of what's bouncy and um, maybe a little bit marchy and what's really flowing. And within a dance that can be true, right? So in this one, um, Ramsey Chase, you have the, the uh, wave in the beginning is very like bum, 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 balance, bum, balance, bum. And 
Uh, and then the rest of it is all very smooth and kind of uh, enticing. And so the tune could amplify that, which then helps the dancer remember. Um, oh. And, um, you know, it's interesting that Joseph paired it with a tune um, because he's clearly thinking explicitly about how the music can help the dancers remember how it goes. Well, Hay in the Barn is a good example of where the band can, I mean, it's actually an easy dance, but it's hard to call because, and I've done this many times, if the band gets in, you, you have to remember, are we in the A part or the B part? Because they're completely symmetric. So the, the music can help the caller, not so much the, in that case, not so much the dancers. Absolutely. Yeah, that and Midwest folklore are dances where I'm like, oh goodness, I should have been paying attention to who people's partners were because now I can't remember where we are. Um, are who are you swinging at all? Yeah. What other existing skills can we use? Point and shoot calling. So you, you know, face your neighbor, Alamand right, where you give some dir the direction they're going to go and tell them, then tell them what to do. Yeah. Yeah, something that I didn't talk about, but that I do also in my intro workshop is I, um, I talk about kind of Simon says that when you are dancing, you do what the caller says and just what the caller says. Um, so for example, flow, um, if you have uh, like an alamand right into a hay, um, then you alamand right once around, and then one of you is facing in and one of you is facing out. And if you can convince people to stop when they're done with the alamand and not flip around, then you're winning as a positional caller because you have more information that you can work with, right? And so that kind of point and shoot calling combined um, with uh, what I think of as Simon Says calling. Um, then it's really helpful. And that happens whether or not you're positional calling. I mean, there's a lot of dances where people kind of say, um, you know, do a thing, but don't do the thing you think is coming next. Um, when I was talking about the right shoulder round into a swing, everyone wants that to be a meltdown swing. And so callers always have to say right shoulder round, but like pause, stop, whatever they do to prevent people from going into the swing and getting that incorrect muscle memory in, in place. Yeah, some good things to think about. Um, you know, I want I wanted to balance out saying, you're a beginner at this, give yourself a break, but also think about the skills you already have that are useful. So the last thing um, that I wanted to do is I'm gonna answer some of the questions that people asked. Um, and then I wanna open it up to other questions. So uh, a lot of questions got asked in the, um, pre-workshop survey. So someone asked, what's the best way to introduce positional calling to a group that's used to role terms, whether gender neutral or not? Um, and for me, um, transparency is key, as is organizational buy-in. Um, and I said at the beginning of this workshop, I've said over and over again, um, that people don't even notice positional calls when I'm calling. Um, and it's true, but I try not to sneak positional calling into a situation. Um, I, and that's because uh, I don't, um, I don't want to make it harder for people than it already is, right? So if you say, um, particularly with organizers, this is what's going to happen. This is what I mean by positional calling. Is this okay with you? And usually I'm having that conversation when it's a dance that's already trying to be gender free in some way. Um, and then I will say like, is it okay with you if I call positionally? Um, if I'm calling in a place where they expect role terms, um, and even if I have a conversation, like sometimes they're like, eh, actually we'd really prefer that you just use role terms. Um, I don't necessarily switch to a completely term-based calling, but I am prepared uh, to use them if people are struggling, you know, as soon, and, or if someone says like, who's doing that? I, I am prepared to sort of say like, oh, it's the gents or it's the Robins or whoever it is doing it um, according to the role terms that are local. So I do think you have to kind of have buy-in um, from the people there. The other thing um, is that I don't make speeches about positional calling and why I do it from this stage, but I do 
invite experienced dancers into the introductory workshop where I explain the logic of positional calling, which you saw a bit of at the beginning of this. Um, and then I also think carefully about my program. If people have given me permission to call positionally, it's my responsibility to make that a good experience for everyone, which is largely about programming. So the second question that I put on here is how do you program for the first time a caller or a group tries it? And when I'm programming for a group that hasn't had a lot of experience or even any experience with positional calling before, I think about three things. I think about fun, I think about flow, and I think about variety. Fun comes first because it's the most important. If I'm gonna have fun, and if the dancers are gonna have fun, I have to have a program that I feel confident about calling. Um, I don't wanna be pushing my skills uh, with, a bun with a bunch of people for whom this is their first exposure to positional calling. And that's partly uh, just sensible, right? Like you should never be calling dances you don't feel confident about calling to a group, uh, particularly if they don't know you, um, if they haven't bought into that idea. Uh, that's why workshops exist. Um, but also because uh, there will be some people who are coming into a dance that's being called positionally who are there to judge its merits. Um, and for better or for worse, you as the caller positionally calling are the representative of the entire endeavor. And so if you call badly and they don't have fun, they're gonna blame it on positional calling. So for me, when I'm doing it, I feel that responsibility pretty seriously. And I think if I can't do this well, I shouldn't be doing it at all because I don't wanna undermine the larger project, which is for me, partly to go gender free, partly to get people to dance better and have more fun at it. Um, and uh, yeah, frankly, partly as my choice of charity at the beginning suggests to support the queer community in having safe spaces. So um, that's a lot of pressure on me that I put on myself admittedly, but that um, I am aware is there. So um, you also want your dancers to feel confident, right? And that's, uh, so you wanna pick a program that they're gonna be able to, to dance. And that's kind of regardless of role. Uh, terms or whatever, again. Um, so it goes back to that premise that I said at the beginning, premise number two, that there's a learning curve and we need to respect it. So you'll feel more confident as a caller if your dances are working for you. Um, and what that means is, um, that goes into the second thing that I said, flow. Uh, dances that have great flow and easy to remember storylines are gonna be dances that the dancers remember that you can call more easily that you can teach well, you can take advantage of all the things that positional calling is really good at. And your dancers will be on your side uh, if they are succeeding at the dances. And then also if they feel like they're getting good variety. Um, so when I program for groups that are doing positional calling for the first time, I try to have that variety in my program. I always have uh, sort of a three facing three dance that gets us away from this idea of kind of binary um, couple normative dancing. Um, or I put in a four facing four because it feels different, but it doesn't have to be as significantly harder. Um, anything that gives you that kind of variety. And also again, like kind of sub motive uh, is to demonstrate um, that positional calling doesn't mean you have to give up variety. You don't have to give up repertoire, um, which is also an anxiety that a lot of people have is like, doesn't it mean you can't call half the dances written? Not really. Um, I mean, I have to admit that I have uh, kind of stayed away from Ramsey Chase. And then when someone brought it up in the survey, I was like, why am I scared of this dance? I could totally call this dance. It's not very hard. There's this little thing that I have to figure out. And so, okay, that was 20 minutes of me messing with different options and kind of thinking about it. But now I'm like, yay, I just have, like, I have a new card now. I can't wait for us to go back to real dancing and I will um, call Ramsey Chase with glee. So, um, you know, that's something I think that uh, that is part of calling, right? Is we, um, when I started calling um, back in the day, I thought every contra dance was hard to call. Um, and now I look at, uh, I was going through my box in early in the pandemic um, because what else are you gonna do? And I was like, why did I put these cards in like this like tricky to call category when I could call them in my sleep? Uh, like, yeah, well, 12 years later, you have a little more experience, Louise, right? Like you learn. Um, so, uh, so yeah, thinking about variety without um, necessarily making it difficult um, or too difficult for you or for them. Which leads into question number three, what are the hardest things to call positionally? 
And this is a deeply personal question. Um, there are some things that pose obvious challenges like the wavy line at the beginning of Ramsey Chase, but there are other things that you might immediately see a solution to that I would sit around with for a week. I think the difficulty is in the teaching, not the calling. Um, that actually calling positionally is the same as calling any other way. It's figuring out how to teach so that you have the right language for those calls, that's hard. Um, so a strong walkthrough is the most important work that you do, but what's hard for you is gonna be easy for other people. And then the last question is just, it's one that has happened to me so many times that I thought I would uh, be being um, irresponsible if I did not address this question. Um, someone said, experienced dancers have a tendency to correct dancers who confound their heteronormative expectations resulting in embarrassment. Basically an experienced dancer who thinks that people are in the wrong place tries to switch them um, when they actually chose the role they're dancing. Um, and then those new dancers are embarrassed and the experienced dancer is embarrassed and it's all kind of terrible. So how can we help newcomers dance in a way that's not embarrassing to them yet gives them the freedom to dance the way they enjoy? And I totally love that whoever asked this question framed it in terms of the new dancer's comfort because I do think that's really important um, there have been a lot of conversations about how to recruit new dancers, how to keep people coming back um, and not embarrassing them is a pretty basic first step. Um, so I don't have a one size fits all solution to this, but um, my first suggestion would be use your intro workshop. Like I said at the beginning, um, I invite experienced dancers in so they also hear me talk about role choices and how people choose and what they're doing. Uh, they hear me say, you're responsible for yourself, not for other people. Um, but also they understand if they've been through a positional workshop at the beginning of the dance, that we are overtly attempting to avoid this kind of heteronormative expectation. If you don't have an intro workshop, you can ask the organizers to communicate clearly about their expectation for the dance. I don't think people accidentally hire positional callers. They're usually, uh, the organizers are usually very much pursuing um, gender-free environments. So they're on your side, ask them to help. Second, um, we all have things that we say every single time we call a contra dance or do a walkthrough and they're just kind of built in kind of automatic things that we say. So you can add things about role preference to that standard set of walkthrough instructions. Um, did you let your partner know which side you prefer dancing on? Remember some people might switch roles with their partner throughout the dance. You're only responsible for yourself. I do try to avoid instructions that imply there's a norm that people are uh, flouting. So I don't say things like, people might not be dancing the role you expect because that suggests that that expectation has validity. But at the same time, it's totally okay, I think, to be honest about the gendered history of social dance. Like there's no one who comes to a contra dance who doesn't understand that the history of American dance or English dance is a gendered history. Like we live in the world, we understand. I look around and I see tons of straight people, I get it yeah, it can be helpful to just acknowledge that like, yes, that's the way it used to be, but it's not that way anymore. And then the last thing is just uh, to, to give people some praise, right? Saying something as simple as, uh, it's so delightful to see people trying new things is huge for some dancers to hear that reinforcement of like trying new things is actually a positive. There was one question that was related to that last um, to question mm -hmm. number four, um, Anna asked it earlier. I've been waiting for an opportunity to present it. How often do experienced dancers bring into the workshop the gendering that you are trying to avoid? Yeah, I mean, I answered that last question because it's happened to me probably at every dance I've ever called. Um, it happens all the time. And it's usually not malicious. It's usually someone who arrived late, uh, who didn't get the memo. It's kind of the, the drawback of positional calling being a little bit invisible is people can do five or six dances and not notice there were no role terms. And they haven't heard something like Larks and Robins. So they haven't been clued in to the fact that there's like something different happening. Um, and so then they do uh, tend to, um, they'll either do that thing where they correct someone on the floor or try to, uh, or they'll holler out like, is it the gents or the ladies? And you're like, kind of neither. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, coping with that, I think is, um, is gonna be a challenge and, until um, the norms have truly changed across the dance community, uh, which we're a ways off from. And a uh, follow up to that, uh, what do you do when the 
dancers are divided as to whether they want positional calling. Maybe the organizers are in for it, some large set of the dancers are in for it, but not everyone. I mean, as a caller, uh, hopefully that's not my problem, but I will speak as an organizer, you know, here in Oklahoma City. Um, I say here in Oklahoma City, I'm not in Oklahoma City, but my primary dance community is in Oklahoma City. Um, so I call positionally when I call in Oklahoma City, but our community as a whole still calls gendered. Um, and the way that I negotiate that is kind of what I said before. Like I am prepared if someone is really upset about not understanding the dance um, and they, especially if they're blaming it on the fact that I appear not to be willing to say gender roles, I will just say it. Um, you know, if the thing that will make people happy is for me to say the ladies chain, then sure, I'm going to say that because the goal is fun, right? The goal is not to be polemical and the goal is not to um, put my ethics over um, the group goal of dancing. So, uh, the flip side of that is that when I do have a stronger role as an organizer, like there's a student group that I advise when we're not pandemic um, that dances and they came to me and they asked about gender free calling many years ago, we switched to shoots and ladders as our role terms. Um, and when I got interested in positional calling, I went to them and I said, look, I know that we all love shoots and ladders. It's super cute and it's fun, but it's, uh, it would be, frankly, easier for me as a caller to standardize as a positional caller so that when I travel, I'm not trying to not say shoots and ladders. Um, and also, I think it's, uh, it's, I mean, I pitched it basically. I was like, I think it'll make you guys better dancers. I think it'll um, improve our goal of being gender neutral or gender free. Um, and so there I could make a case for it, but I had a bunch of young people who were already invested in the overall kind of social effects of that switch. In a community where you have disagreement, I think that you have to work through that as a community, like no single caller is gonna um, make that change, but you can be an advocate, right? You can you can say, well, here's why I like it as a caller and as a dancer um, and try to get people to have, I mean, we had a conversation when I stopped using the word gypsy um, and I started using right shoulder round. Um, several of our dancers got quite upset with me about it um, but we are a strong community. And so I just said like, you know, here are all the reasons that I think it's terrible and um, why it's uncomfortable for me to say that word. And, um, you know, I, I'm an art historian and I study histories of race and racialization. So I had kind of a long <laughs> speech about all the reasons I think it's important. Um, and, uh, and so at the end of that conversation, I don't think that I had persuaded the dancer who was arguing vociferously about it, but he certainly conceded that he understood my point of view and that he wasn't gonna complain when I made that change, um, even though he personally didn't empathize with it particularly. So I think it can be our job to have those conversations and just be, be good kind of calm advocates for, for what we think and how we feel. Um, you know, for me, I think uh, it was really helpful to start saying to people like, I am uncomfortable in this environment right now, you know, as someone who uh, is not heteronormative myself, um, I don't like dancing in these spaces. I don't like every time I go through a line being told that I'm the prettiest gent in the line. Um, it's sexual harassment. It's actually like in a university context, I could sue you for violating Title IX. And there's a reason for that because it's unpleasant um, and it's inappropriate. And so, as I say, like being an advocate for yourself or for people in your community, being a good ally um, and having those conversations in good faith, I think is really important. Is a showstopper question. Please, I have a, a question concerning, well, not a question, but you, I, in your notes, you put uh, left hand, right hand person, left hand person. And I, I, I'm when I've done this and I use right side person, left side person, because I thought the concept of the hand is 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 ambiguous because it has two meanings, in both your literally your hand and the side you're on. So I, I tend to use uh, the right side, left side rather than hand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me that's something that's very context dependent. Um, 
you know, if, uh, if I'm talking, I mean, I would never use it as a, as a substitute role term. I wouldn't just say like right-hand people, do -si do because that doesn't make any sense. But right side people, do -si do also kind of doesn't make sense. Um, like I could definitely see dancers screeching to a halt and kind of trying to figure out if that meant like all the people on the right side of their hands for, or like the people on the right hand side of the hall or like who were you talking to? Um, and so thinking about how are you talking about hands or sides in relation to the flow of the dance to the choreography itself, um, which is why I was like saying, like for me, every dance is a new problem. It's not kind of uh, find and replace. Like every time I say ladies chain, make it a right hand chain um, or uh, anything like that. It's really look at the dance holistically, think about how it works um, and make a walkthrough and a set of calls that makes sense. Thanks again to Friends of Cecil Sharp House for organizing and hosting this. Um, and thank you all for coming. Thank you, this has been awesome. <laughs> thank you, and may I remind people that Louise has waived her fee for this session. So if you would like to show your appreciation to Louise, she is fundraising for the Albert Kennedy Trust that she's mentioned a few times. I'm just sharing the link now. So if you would like to show your appreciation and donate to that charity, I know we, she would appreciate that very much. And um, thank you, Louise, all the comments. There have been really positive comments in the chat. You've inspired a lot of people. So <laughs> thank you so much for your time and effort. And thank you, everyone, for joining us.